Hey guys, Ash and Steve coming at you live from PAX West, and by that I mean live from our PAX West hotel room. Uh, we just got back from the show floor. It's day four and we're wrapping up here, but we got to play a ton of indie games that we want to tell you all about. And, and some uh, not so indie games. And some not so indie games. Yeah, there are a couple there. Now you're going to see me and us referencing my phone. I'm not just on my phone chilling. It is because we played so many games that I had to write them all or type them all down here to remember everything we played. Uh, so personally, one of the first things I played and was a real highlight for me. Uh, my first appointment at the show was Way Forward, and they brought River City Girls 2 Ugh. and Lunark uh, with them to the show. And I guess we'll start with the more obvious one first, River City Girls 2. We all, we know you all are looking forward to it. We're looking forward to it. Absolutely. The original River City Girls was awesome. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say that uh, the demo they brought to PAX, I just don't think it was quite ready for prime time. Oh, really? Uh, the game is going to be great. I don't doubt that. But it was capped at 30 FPS. And oh. the, the TV they had us playing on, there was massive input delay. So mm. for a beat-em-up, that's just that's the death knell, right? Yeah. So I could tell that what I was playing was going to be a worthy sequel in its finished state. Sure. But again, it was capped at 30 FPS compared to the original, which is a smooth 60. Yeah. And we you know when everything you do is registered on screen like half a second or more oh, in a beat em up, it was really bad. It was not optimized yeah. for that display at all. Well, I didn't get to play River City Girls 2, and, and I'm excited for it too. I yeah. loved the original. Uh, but one of the things that I heard a lot from developers on the show floor was that they kind of decided at the last minute to attend PAX West this year. Yeah. And, and that's true for me too. Yeah. I, I didn't, uh, I, I had been saying for what, like three, four months before the show that I wasn't going to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, because PAX West 2021 was kind of more a down-tempo affair, not a lot of stuff. If you saw our videos last year, you know that the show floor <laughs> looked like something ripped out of EGM from 2002. Right. Um, but then I heard Nintendo was coming back, and I was like, that's a, actually a really good sign for the overall health of the show. Yeah. It means, one, uh, if you don't know, Nintendo is probably one of the more health-conscious uh, companies in terms of COVID restrictions and yeah. stuff like that. They won't go uh, unless they think that there's you know, minimal risk yeah. uh, to to the safety of the folks at the show. Um, so that kind of made me more comfortable. Uh, not that PAX West 2021 had issues, but also they pulled in at like the last minute, like at zero yeah. hour. And so I finally was like, okay, I'm going. And I heard a lot from other developers that we talked to that they had that same mentality. Like they realized very late that PAX West was going to be like a quote unquote real show. Right. And so they pulled together. And, and what that means sometimes is, okay, you know, we're going to take the stuff we can get. Uh, a couple developers told us that they didn't even actually make PAX West demos. So they just took what they had yeah. available and brought it. Well, and that is word for word, actually, the, what happened with River City Girls 2. I was told the same thing at my, uh, at my uh, way forward appointment that they decided to come at the last second. I mean, hell, they didn't even have their own booth. They actually came with limited run games. Oh, wow. And so they were partnering with limited run to kind of run a co-booth. Nice. And, uh, and so it was great. But yeah, when I when I kind of pointed out that River City Girls 2 didn't quite seem like it was ready to be demoed at the show, it was very much like, yeah, honestly, it's not quite ready, but we decided to come at the last second. We knew people wanted to see it. And to be clear, I, you know, I played as one of the new characters. There are now six playable characters to start with oh. instead of just two. So, in, you know, of course, in the original, it's Misako and Kyoko. Yeah. Uh, in this game, you get Misako, Kyoko, Kunio, Ricky, and then two what? new characters. Oh, I didn't even Brand know Kunio and Ricky were in it. Yeah, So, and, and you can get them from the start now. So, uh, definitely the promise is there. And to be very clear, I'm not worried about this game at all. It's just clearly was not ready to be shown right. at the show. And that display, they needed to get a better TV for it. Because yeah. there was so much input lag and it was ridiculous. But the other thing that I really want to talk about at Way Forward was Lunark. And this is a cinematic platformer in the vein of games like Out of This World, Oh wow! Uh, Prince of Persia, and it had rotoscoped animation. Oh, just that, like that's those one games. of my favorite styles. Yeah, it's, it's rotoscoped, the, the, the whole thing, and it's like this sci-fi, pulpy, cinematic platformer. Nice. And it's it's very cerebral, very slow paced. It's not run and gun like you know Mega Man, for example. It's very much like if you played Out of This World, you know, the, your movements are very deliberate in those games, yeah. right? You're, you're moving, you're stopping, you're attacking, but you're doing them all in succession and really thinking about each move that you make. Yeah. And you can't fall too far, you know, if you fall even a little <laughs> bit too far, you die. You know, it's kind of like that Prince of Persia again. But just the, the atmosphere in this game and the animation, again, like I said, all rotoscoped animation and the, the animation was all done by one person. 
and oh, it wow. was so That's incredible. Gotta be a lot. Some of the coolest pixel animation you've seen, and so if you're into that kind of stuff, cinematic platformers, especially games like Out of This World, Lunark should be on your radar. And I was told that it's almost ready to go. It's either gonna be out later this year or beginning of next year. And I can't wait to play it. I was told it's about eight hours, so very nice and nice. bite-sized, yeah. not too long. I know none of us have enough time to play the games we want to, all the games we want to these days. So if you're into that kind of thing, Lunar should be on your radar. Uh, but that's enough for me for now. Steve, any any games in particular you would like to? Uh, yeah, I actually I actually started thinking. I was like, I didn't write down uh, anything that we did at the Play On booth, and I spent right. all of Saturday at yeah, the Play On booth. Yeah, I wasn't there for that. Um, and and the first one I have to shout out because I'm partial to uh, the developer of this game. Uh, I played Gungrave Gore, oh, uh, right. which is like. It, it's a it's a sequel to the original Gungrave game, uh, but it still very much retains like the original uh -huh. look and feel. Like your the main character carries like this just big ass crazy coffin <laughs> behind him at nice. all times, and that's his melee weapon. He has two guns. It's, it's very much like a kind of like a take on you know the whatever you would call the genre that is like Devil May Cry and Bayonetta. Uh -huh. um, you know, but it's it's a little bit more slower, more deliberately paced. Um, the action is, it feels like a mid 2000s arcade game mm -hmm. and that's very much intentional um the developer it turns out is a huge fan of ours uh -huh. um, which is so cool you yeah. told me that i'm like i hate that i missed this yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's some real talent behind this the uh composer for the game is the same composer for the devil may cry series Sick. uh yeah. it felt incredibly good you know and it was funny because this this guy literally exists in our circles because he was he's like oh have you seen that sakurai video on hit stop uh -huh. like we're doing a lot I of that in that. this game he's like every gunshot you know, we have that little bit of hit stop so that you register the impact of each attack. Right. And, and when playing it, that definitely like shines through. You feel it. Uh, it. It very much has kind of that. You know, he's he's like, we're not. You know, this isn't a triple A game. It's a it's a solid like just sit down, turn your brain off, and and just enjoy shooting things kind of mm -hmm. kind of experience. And it definitely bore out that way. The demo was utterly fantastic. I I loved it to death. It's stylish as hell. It looks. It's got cool. that like veneer of like early 2000s cheese <laughs> like right. everything is just over the top and intentionally really silly i love that i i couldn't get enough of it i can't wait to play more of it um i could go on about play on and and uh -huh. the other stuff they had so well before we move on you did say intentionally over the top and intentionally silly and i feel like there's one game we've got to cover before we move on from play on and of course the big one goat simulator 3. right which yeah. i'm so sad i didn't get to play. oh man it's so good <laughs> so we played a ton of goat simulator 3 uh, over at the booth. It is every bit as crazy as you would expect. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know that Goat Simulator got like a ton of DLC. Mm -hmm. They mentioned that they're starting out with a much more focused experience. So it's gonna be like a single map at launch. Uh, but <laughs> the the amount of weird off the wall stuff I was able to do in this game was hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, you don't have to be a goat. And I don't know if that's, I didn't play a ton of Goat Simulator 1. Right. So I don't know if that's like a thing that was available in those games. So don't come at me in the comments <laughs> if, if you're, you know. They already but, are, it's already Yeah, happening. I know, it's already yeah. happening. Yeah. Somebody's typing out a comment. They're like, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> but I played as a giraffe. Um, what? Um, yeah, like, and, and they call it Tall Goat. Like, so a giraffe is called Tall, Tall Goat. goat. <laughs> and, and there are missions to like do a backflip and it's literally physically impossible as the giraffe oh, to do it because so it changes good. the actual physics of the character. Right. Um, but it, it's just distilled chaos. Like you can grind <laughs> on rails as though you were Sonic in Adventure That's 2. So but good. if you do it long enough, you end up warping into hyperspace and everything starts exploding around you. You have a, a rocket launcher that you can mm. like attach rockets to people and things and they go flying off. You can headbutt people <laughs> into the fucking sun. Um, as you do. One of my favorites was, uh, I d and I don't remember how I unlocked it because I was just in tears laughing the whole time I was playing. Uh, I inadvertently turned my goat into a banana. Oh, and sure. it, As you do. Yeah. As you do. And then uh, on top of that, I located a power-up that was a saddle. And the only thing that power-up would do is you could force other people to ride you. But you could also, as the banana, like, in a very suggestive fashion, fire a seed out of your body oh, no. that would turn anything it hit into another sentient banana. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah, just a ton of different stuff. And I know we have like a million games to talk about, but I could literally talk about Goat Simulator for, for probably the whole hour. But um, it's an excellent game. Like, this is, again, you know, turn your brain off, have fun, right. except instead of you know, shooty bang stuff, you're you're gonna be laughing like the whole time you play this. And it, it runs incredibly well. 
you know, uh, we were told that we'll be getting a ton of codes for it, so we'll be yeah. we'll be doing this on Twitch probably as soon as they let us. That'll uh, be a blast. But it, but definitely one of my highlights of the show. Nice. Well, speaking of highlights, and now this is one that I discovered back on Friday or Saturday, I believe, day two, and you just saw it today. Uh, Haiku the Robot at the PAX Rising area. Oh my area. god, yes. And this is something our compatriot Derek would love too because it's a Metroidvania. Yep. And it's a it's a 2D animated uh, Metroidvania inspired by Game Boy aesthetic specifically. Yep. And think something like Gato Roboto. It's it's different from Gato Roboto, but that's kind of what I first thought of. And you thought of Kunai, right? Yes. I, yeah. So the, for me, the fact that the main character is like kind of and, and I like a sentient object with yeah. like a like a steam, like, steampunkish robot yeah, type. Yeah. But thing. like with a face, like you know, a very yeah. kind of expressive face. Yeah. If you've ever played Kunai, it's a very similar vibe. Just mm -hmm. this one uses a lot more like dark colors, whereas Kunai uses right. like lighter blues and, and greens and stuff. Uh, but, you know, both games seem incredibly interesting. The mechanics in in a Haiku the Robot were were really good looking, very Mega Man inspired. Right, and I think that Haiku can actually repair himself too. To like, oh, kind of nice. like uh, in, in Hollow Knight, how you can spend uh, whatever the current, like the, the meter is to refill your own health. I think right. Haiku can repair himself, which is really cool. Oh, and, that is cool. And I actually got, well, we got code for it, and it comes out on Switch uh, on Friday the 9th, same day as Splatoon 3. So uh, well, I'm gonna be doing like a first look video on the channel for it, just to, you know, to get it out there and see if, you know, who it appeals to, because I think if you're into Metroidvanias, especially 2D pixel animated ones, this is not a game you should miss. And yeah, you know, I, hey, agree. I love my 2D games. So. I, I actually, before at, before I realized Ash was pointing it out to me, we were walking by it and I stopped so yeah. I could stare at it. It's one of those games that uh, if you if you don't hear about it, it's going to be easy for it to fly under your radar, unfortunately. But Especially if you see it in action, it's ninth. so it's so gripping. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, Splatoon 3 is going to be dominating the ninth. We all get that. But this to me seems like the perfect thing to kind of mix it up a little bit between Turf Wars. Oh, absolutely. And just kind of, you know, spend a little time with something single player, a world, you know, just a world you're exploring. I just really like the character and the vibe of this world. And it just maybe want to see more of it. So I'm really excited. And I did talk to the developer. Another bite-sized experience, eight, eight-ish hours, eight to ten, which again I really it's appreciate perfect. more than anything these days. Uh, so yeah, and you and I, well, actually all four of us, uh, Brandon and Daniel aren't here right now, but all four of us spent quite a bit of time at Thunderful yesterday, yep. and uh, we got to play all six of their games. They have a, they had, they brought six games to PAX West this year. All of them, honestly, were really cool and very yeah. diverse. Uh, you, in particular, uh, and I know Brandon played this specifically, but you, we watched it, and you really liked The Last Hero of Nostalgia, right? Yeah, and, and before you light us up, it is pronounced Nostalgia. Yes, it's I, not I, Nostalgia. We were corrected multiple times when yes. we called it the, the Last Hero of Nostalgia. Um, yeah. and it's definitely spelled the right way to be Nostalgia. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, we played this game. This is a uh, very interesting take on the Soulsborne genre. So it's um, the, the way they mentioned it to us, and of course we don't have full story details because what kind of demo would tell you the whole story of a game, but right. uh, you take on the role of a hero and it looks at first to be pseudo-modern, like, you know, the visuals are, are intentionally pixelated in places and that's because in the world of this game, pixel, uh, pixelation is viewed as a disease right. uh, to be stamped out and you turn out to be like the supposedly, we don't know, but the hero of legend, and you're just a stack of pixels, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they, they do a lot of spoofing of the Soulsborne genre. They, you know, you go through a character creator and there's a bunch of options that literally don't do anything because right. you don't have any any facial features to speak of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so you're in this world that's kind of, sort of, realistic 3D, it, certainly compared to your character. Yeah. Uh, and you're fighting monsters that have various levels of like graphical quality, you could yeah. say. Yeah, fidelity, uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. graphical fidelity. It, it's definitely an, a very interesting uh, premise for a game. And it, it actually plays really close to how actual Soulsborne games mm -hmm. play. Like the, the moment to moment combat is engaging and really fun mm -hmm. and responsive. Like they nailed the controls, uh, but it's just kind of like a a parody that doesn't uh, that doesn't skimp on like the challenge or, or the gameplay elements. It's, it's right. probably one of my standouts at all of PAX because mm -hmm. this is a game where I was talking to the guy, uh, one of the folks that worked on uh, Fogs, Physics Dogs, that two-headed dog game, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very wild tonal shift. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asking him about it. I was like, please let me know when I can get my hands on this. Yeah. This is both 
like a great game to play from a mechanical perspective and the premise is hilarious like i can't wait to see more of this and we will have an extended look soon they they offered to send us a early build of the game so we can show you uh, some more gameplay but you're probably seeing just a little bit of it on the right. screen right now and one thing i noticed about it while i was watching it uh, while watching brandon play it was all the meta humor there's so yes. much meta humor stuffed into this game so if that's your jam a lot of fourth wall breaking a lot of you know tongue-in-cheek jokes about the game industry you know games basically taking the piss out of themselves yeah if you're if that's kind of your thing and you're into that kind of humor you're, you gotta check out this game, because it's full of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the games I played at Thunderful that I have been excited about, and I believe this was originally shown off during the Thunderful, War Thunderful World like direct style presentation we reacted to. Right, I think with Mark Hamill. Year. With Mark Hamill, right, yeah. We didn't react with Mark Hamill. We wish he, we had. We but reacted he, he with him in it. spirit. Yes, but uh, Wave Tail. And this is a game that's <laughs> it's out on Stadia. It's, it's a Stadia exclusive <laughs> <laughs> until like, Soon so it's not out year. yet, is what we're saying. Yeah, exactly. It's not out yet. Uh, it's supposed to be out soon on consoles and PC. Uh, I think probably within the next couple of months is what they told me. And it's essentially like an, an a 3D action adventure game, very much in the vein uh, of The Wind Waker in terms of its visual style. Oh, nice. It's uh, it, you know it's got this really beautiful cell shaded cartoony vibe to it. Um, the combat is a little bit rough, but not it. It's rough in the sense not that the mechanics are broken or anything, but it feels a bit like a PS2 generation 3D action combat game, kind of like Kena. Okay. But if you're in the mood for that, it's perfect, right? It's like the nice. perfect vibe. And it kind of reminded me a bit of Beyond and Good and Evil, the way the combat worked. And, you know, but what's cool about it is that it's got this beautifully cel-shaded cartoony world that you can surf on the water. Like the, 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 the oh, world nice. is, is basically like a giant ocean dotted with islands, various islands that you can explore more of as you advance through the game. But just the the feeling of gliding on the water. Your character can essentially run and glide on the water. And you can leap nice. and do all these cool things and the feeling you get when you leap off of like a tower on an island and see the water stretching out before you and you land in the water and you jump back up and you're gliding, it just feels so cool. Man, I wanna play this it's now. It's really cool. So I would say it's like Wind Waker crossed with a bit of Beyond Good and Evil and it felt really, really neat. The, and actually the character designs, the, uh, the, like the facial animations and character designs kind of reminded me a little bit of Mega Man Legends crossed with Gitaru Man of all things, which oh, wow. is really random, I know, but that if is. you see it, you'll see what I mean. And uh, it's, it's definitely not the most polished game I've played at PAX, but if you're in, in the mood for a you know, PS2, GameCube, Xbox era 3D action platformer that has this really unique art style, it really scratches that itch really well, Ooh, I'd say. Man, so. sign me up. Do you mind if I interject and no, talk about, so you, you mentioned like PS2, GameCube era, and so that got me thinking about older style games. And there was one other game uh, that is gonna be niche as hell for our audience, but um, I did get to play the System Shock kind of oh. pseudo remake. Oh, okay. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, if you uh, System Shock is a 90s PC game, and if you've ever played those, that'll evoke a certain image in your mind of, of a very particular aesthetic. Um, at the Play On booth, they had System Shock, which I just remembered. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And it is, uh, they've, they've retooled the game. It's now a first person, uh, I don't wanna call it a first person shooter because it focuses much more on like melee weapons and stealth and horror mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But it's set in like a cyberpunk world. And the thing, it, that's not really what I found interesting about it because Frankly, there are now many games right. that could fit that description. Uh, but what was interesting to me is that they intentionally went for a visual style that was something of a fusion of like that old 90s PC aesthetic and modern 3D visuals. Mm -hmm. And the result is something that's quite unlike anything I've ever seen nice. in, in a video game. So you have like intentionally low res textures in certain places, like, oh. but you know, what I would call like next gen lighting effects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's kind of this weird, I, I wish I would, had like an art major sitting here with right. me so they could like accurately describe the art style. But it, it looks like if you took like cutscenes out of a 90s PC game mm -hmm. and you just modernize them with, with oh, cool. you know, current visual uh, techniques. So hopefully there's some gameplay for you to see on screen because yeah. I'm stumbling over my words just trying to describe it. But it's such a unique and beautiful game. 
So going back to Thunderful for a little bit, uh, just a couple, a couple of other games I wanted to touch on before we move on. Uh, one game that I got to see Daniel play was a really cool game made by a two-person French team. Only two people made this whole game. Oh wow! Called Worldless, and it's like a, a 2D. Uh, I guess it is a Metroidvania, but it has kind of an Ori aesthetic to it. Oh wow! Where you're I like that. you're playing as like this formless character that that uh, it, it's. Their powers are based on the concepts of femininity and masculinity, and, and their abilities All right. differ based on those attributes. And what's really neat about it is it has a Paper Mario style like battle system. So oh, even wow. though you're running around this world and you're exploring, when you encounter an enemy, they're all one-on-one -on -one fights, and you, it's turn-based combat, but you can do timed attacks, you can def time your defense to take less damage. And so it's a really neat marriage of like, kind of a Metroidvania vibe, but with, again, turn-based Paper Mario-esque battles, and uh, it has a, with Ori-esque aesthetics, and kind of almost like a bit of an Okami vibe too. Which, if you know me, that's a good thing. So, nice. uh, so definitely keep an eye out for that one. That's coming out in 2023. Uh, Worldless, though, and you're probably seeing some footage from it right now, uh, and it just looks absolutely beautiful. And another one I wanted to mention, and this has been kind of going around for a little bit, Planet of Lana, and you saw me play this yes. one. This game is beautiful. Oh, so gorgeous, you guys. Like. Think of a 2D Last Guardian, uh, kind of with, uh, kind of combined with like Limbo-esque vibes, because you're playing as like like a little boy, much like you would in Limbo. But instead of it being like super dark and and you know your your player character is like a shadow, this is a lush, beautiful, almost like watercolory, yeah, like, pa like painted world. And your player character, the boy, has an animal companion that you use to solve environmental puzzles. So it's not very combat focused. It's more uh, it's more like a puzzle platformer, and you use this, you know, little animal buddy that you have with you to solve all these, you know, environmental riddles and physics-based puzzles, and the music is gorgeous in this game, and it's just, it drew me in with its kind of painterly stuff, like, vibe. Yeah. And, yeah, you saw me play this, Yeah, right? we, we first saw this game at, I want to say it was an Xbox Indie Showcase last year. Yeah, yeah. And it drew us all in then, mm -hmm. and seeing it in motion, actually, you know, I didn't play it personally, but I watched you. Right. And it's just more of what we saw in that trailer, and I mean that in, in a very complimentary way. Like, it is, yeah. this game just continues to deliver. I can't wait to actually try it out. I think this one's coming to Game Pass, isn't it? Uh, I believe it is, and this is like the perfect kind of game for Game Pass, yeah. I think. I, I, would, I would buy it anyway, because I, I was drawn in by it so much. But yeah, it's gonna be on Game Pass, so if you're not sure if it's your thing, well, you can check it out on Game Pass. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, there were a couple other games that unfortunately Brandon and Daniel are here to talk about. Swordship and Togus, definitely check those out. Uh, Swordship is kind of like a bullet hell. Except you're not attacking things, you're avoiding things and trying to grab packages nice. and race to the finish while all these things are trying to kill you. And <laughs> nice. it's got kind of like this cool 90s art deco style to it. It's really cool. Oh man. Uh, and then Togus is like a really cute, like puzzle, uh, isometric puzzle game where it looks like, I, I couldn't quite get the vibe from watching Brandon, but it looks like you're collecting fruit and multiplying fruit everywhere. Brandon would be able to tell you more about it if he was here, but he's unfortunately busy at the moment. But I'm sure he'll lay some awesome gameplay footage of the game oh, for yeah, you for sure. uh, over the video. And there are just a couple of other indies to talk about before we wrap up here. Uh, and I just spent a few, like several hours yesterday just kind of wandering. One of the coolest things about PAX is you just, if you love indie games like we do, you can just wander and find all yeah. sorts of cool games that you've never heard of before. Uh, one of which is, and speaking of Brandon, one I really wanted to, wanted him to play because I think it would appeal to him, is Asterigos, Curse of the Stars by Acme Game Studio. And I could be saying that wrong, maybe it's Asterigos, I don't know. But it's essentially a 3D action RPG uh, that kind of gave me Kena, Bridge of Spirits vibes, but it has combat that's a little bit more intense than that, a, a little bit more akin to Monster Hunter yeah. or a Souls-like game. Yeah, and the main character you you saw the, the main character today and kind of saw some of the demos and you were like, whoa, this game looks cool. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, you know, I don't usually pick up like the little promotional cards for games and stuff like yeah. that. But this was one I was like, I want to make sure that this like that when I'm unpacking at home, yeah. that I remember to go find this game. So it, it looks absolutely gorgeous. The world, the world is stunning. But I really, really love the design of the main character. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't want to say she gives me Aloy vibes or anything like that, but it's it's a cool ass female protagonist. Yeah. She's got a dope sword. Like I just, the minute I saw this, I was like, I want to beat things up as this person. Well, and what's cool is that she can actually switch between like six different weapon types in the game because I played the demo and she gets oh, nice. not just a sword and shield, but twin daggers and a hammer. 
and a oh, staff cool. for long range attacks. So you can you can fight in all these different ways and really mix and match the weapons to suit your personal play style. And uh, this just seemed like a really cool game that I personally enjoyed. Again, if you like Hina Bridge of Spirits, but you wanted something more out of the combat, this might be right up your alley. So definitely check that out. Uh, another game that I personally really liked, you know me, I love my 2D games, but Alterium Shift by Dratzy Games LLC. Directly, as soon as you see it, you know it's directly inspired by, you know, the greats like Chrono Trigger, FF6. It's got this gorgeous pixel yeah. animation, turn-based combat. The typeface in the game is pulled straight out of the Soul Blazer trilogy on Super Nintendo. So if you played Illusion of Gaia, Terra Enigma, nice. you know what I'm talking about. It's got that super old school vibe to it. If you love those games, you know, Alterium Shift isn't trying to be anything new or innovative. It's just, right. it's doing what a lot of people love so much and it's doing it well, seemingly. Yeah. And uh, it's not due for release until next year, but I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. Uh, Steve, you got to play the One Piece game, uh, or, or a new, I, not the One Piece game, a new I One Piece game. I did. One Piece Odyssey, right? I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have been fair for us, especially with how many One Piece fans, not only there are in the world, but specifically in our audience, for us to go to PAX, see tons of demo stations for a One Piece game and not try it out. Um, but Brandon and I both played this, and, and I know he and I are of the same opinion. We discussed it privately after the demo. And it's just disappointing. That's too bad. Uh, you know, it's there. there's a lot to like about it. Mm -hmm. I want to be clear. Uh, visually, it's stunning. Like, mm -hmm. it looks it looks really, really great. Uh, the, the combat system is just a standard turn-based combat system. Uh, they do this kind of interesting thing where characters exist in different zones mm -hmm. and are, like, walled off by enemies, so mm -hmm. they can't... You know, there's there's chances for like you can have technically two or three battles going on within one larger battle. Uh, so you could have like Luffy and Zoro fighting a group of enemies, and mm -hmm. then Sanji and Usopp fighting a different group. And you can even have what they I think they called them dramatic scenes, where like one character at the start of the fight is knocked out. Oh, okay. And so you have to fight your way to them and and rescue oh, them, cool. which I thought was a really cool thing. But that's the only really cool thing. Okay. Uh, it kind of has what I what I've come to dub like the jump force problem, oh, and that's wow. that everything feels very stiff and artificial. Right. Uh, when you see the character models are really well detailed, but they don't look like the characters from the anime right. in yeah. a weird way. They have that kind of weird shading on them where I know exactly. It's what like you they mean. try. They look like three D pre rendered graphics. Yeah. Um, and on top of that. The combat system can kind of drag because all of the attack animations, at least in the demo we played, are not skippable. Mm. So if you're doing special attacks and a lot of them, battles get really long just because you have to watch the attack every single time. And they're gorgeous, but it, you know, in any turn-based RPG, you, you want the option to be able to move past them and, and keep the game flowing. Uh, but I think the biggest mark against the game for me was that just exploring the environment is patently not fun. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's literally an icon pointing you to every single thing you can do. Your hand is held so incredibly hard oh, that it's like, yeah. oh, hey, here's a point of interest. And you can see the icon from across the map. And then you walk over to it and you push circle and Luffy says a thing and then you go to the next one. Yeah. So there's no real like incentive to explore because it's all pulled away from you because they don't trust you to find it. Right. And then, you know, you can you can like traverse gaps with uh, Luffy's ability to stretch, but it's just push a button and then he does everything for you. So it, it felt like it was just moving from battle to battle and the battles themselves were just kind of easy and repetitive. So, OK, I mean, I hope that they improve it because presentation wise, it's a very gorgeous game. And I think Die Hard One Piece fans will love it. Mm -hmm. But if you're not one of those diehards, there's nothing here for you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, if you're watching this video, you know that we are we are Good Vibes Gaming. We love all the good vibes. And a game that gives me good vibes is Earthbound. And I think a lot of you watching oh, yeah. love Earthbound. We love Earthbound. And I actually encountered two games that had super overt Earthbound vibes here oh, nice. at PAX. And uh, the first one I want to mention is Crystal Story, Dawn of Dusk. And this is by Fly High Works. Uh, I, co I couldn't find anyone to talk to about it. It was kind of its own like unattended demo station at the, at the tiny build area. Oh, nice. But this game was cool. I think it's uh, it might be on early access Steam right now. I don't know if it's coming to consoles. Uh, again, I couldn't find someone to talk to about it, but this has this game has clearly, it's a it's an action, like a 2D Zelda-esque action RPG, top-down view, 
with clearly Earthbound inspired pixel art. Like oh, the wow. main character looks for all the world like a sprite edit of Lucas a little bit, oh, but geez. definitely different enough. Like she has hair that's on fire, which is really cool. Oh, that's cool. It's definitely different enough that it's its own thing, but it's clearly Earthbound inspired. The dialogue is very Undertale-esque. It's got that Earthbound Undertale vibe to it. But what's neat is that uh, you have your physical attacks, but you also have uh, spells, and, so, and sometimes the two have to work in tandem for you have to be for you to be able to defeat enemies. So you might have to light an enemy on fire and then attack it to kill it, or you might have to explode like a bomb flower in order to make an enemy vulnerable, and then only can you kill it with a physical attack. And, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, and it just it had kind of a really cool quirky vibe to it, but also like a really serious dark bent to it that kind of gave me goosebumps when I was playing it. Like, oh, this is going to be kind of a creepy game, kind of like Undertale. It's very warm and inviting when you first play it, but then when you really get into it, you're like, oh, there's some pretty messed up stuff going on in here. And I definitely got that vibe from Crystal Story. And the other one uh, is Cricket, Jay's Really Peculiar Game by Studio Kumiho. And uh, this is like Earthbound vibes, married to Paper Mario-esque battle mechanics by way of a Saturday morning cartoon aesthetic. Jeez. Yeah, it, it's like you're, it, it looks like uh, like a cartoon, like maybe Craig of the Creek or something like that. It's kind of got that vibe to it, uh, or that art style to it, but you're, it's playable, obviously. It's a game, and it's got the, you know, Earthbound-esque writing and kind of emotional vibes to it, but then you get into battles, and there's like a Paper Mario time to attack, time defense mechanic at play. And it was just very, very unique. It unfortunately doesn't have a publisher yet, so it's still quite a ways out from release, but it is something I wanted to point out just to, you know, if you love Earthbound like we do, this game should be on your radar as well. Uh, and I think the last one to mention, I'd like to go out on a really high positive note, and I know you and I both loved seeing this game, and for me, and at least playing it, Melatonin. Yes, oh my Melatonin god, by, this by, game. Oh man, it's, and the, the, the developer is perfectly named. They're, they're half asleep games, which is <laughs> perfect. But, and, and Melatonin isn't a new, like it's been around for a little bit. It's not out yet, but we've known about it. We just, I only got to play it for the first time here at PAX West 2022. And it's essentially Indie Rhythm Heaven. Nintendo yeah. won't make a Rhythm Heaven game or a new one. So thankfully, you know, indie devs are taking up the mantle and making their own. And half asleep games are are coming are, are just really killing it with melatonin. And I got to play a couple of the mini games, and it's just, I mean, it's rhythm heaven. If you love rhythm heaven, that's what this is. And it's it's basically a story about dreams. And I guess you're the the whole thing is you're kind of trying to piece together this slightly vague story um, about this character who's dreaming about various things in his life. And so there's definitely a dreamlike quality to it, I would say, right? A very yeah, dreamlike aesthetic. Yeah. It, it has like, it uses a lot of like, I don't want to say pastels, but like light blues, light purples. Pinks, stuff whites. Stuff evocative of the idea of like fantasy or, or sleep and- Dreaminess. Yeah, dreaminess yeah. is a good way to put it. And you know, it's, it's a, uh, I'm not a big rhythm game person. Right. You know, if you know me and, and you know what I, uh, my preferences are, you know, that rhythm games don't really do it for me. You know, I was a big DDR fan back in the day, but that was about as far as it went. Uh, but this game, just seeing the trailer, and hopefully we're running some trailer footage or yeah, some, some actual sure game are. footage, it's just, uh, it takes the idea of a rhythm game and marries it to, again, if if you're not familiar with Rhythm Heaven, I agree, it's totally like Rhythm Heaven, but <laughs> yeah. if you need an explainer like I sometimes do about what Rhythm Heaven is, it, imagine the marriage of a traditional rhythm game and WarioWare. Yeah. Like micro games that are set solely to the pace of music. Uh, and, and the music they used, at least in the trailer, I didn't get to play the game on the show floor, but the music in the trailer sounded perfect for the type of aesthetic they're delivering. Kind of like a, uh, like a chill, like chiptune lo-fi vibe. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and these games are typically played with one button. You can just press one button. They're very simple, but that lets them layer on really complex beats that you have to hit. So you're not doing all these crazy button combinations. It's just one button that you're hitting, but that allows them to introduce different time signatures and different and really, you know, kind of challenge you in that way. And you're doing really, you know, they're really clever scenarios like swiping a credit card to pay for things to the yeah. beat, right? Or playing a VR game and you're shooting aliens to the beat, stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, the footage you're seeing right now could exp is explaining it way better than we could, but if you love Rhythm Heaven or if you want to try Rhythm Games and maybe see if they're for you, this seems like a great entry point. 
Uh, I, there are different difficulties you can play each stage on, so it's not just hardcore. You can, yeah. You can practice each stage, you can play on... Yeah, it's, it's definitely not only for the hardcore rhythm game fans. It seems to be a game for everybody, and... Yeah, y'all watching this channel have known, have heard me complain and, and whine about not having a new Rhythm Heaven game forever. And I'm getting this, and I can't wait. It's uh, It was supposed to come out this month in September, but they did decide to delay it at the last second for a little more quality checks and yeah, stuff like good. that. Which is, hey, delay it till it's ready, right? So they're looking at a uh, beginning of 2023 release date right now. But I just wanted to end on that note because Melatonin was easily one of the games oh, yeah. that stood out to me most here at, uh, well, us here at PAX West 2022, and I do believe that brings us to the end of this PAX West wrap-up discussion. Anything else you want to mention? Uh, no, I, I think we all had a great time at PAX. Yeah. You know, it was a much better show. Than much last better year. show. Than, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, a lot more to cover, a lot more to see, a lot more to do, uh, and and a lot more, you know, on a personal note, a lot more of our friends to connect with, which was great. It's so, um, I mean, I, 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 I've been going back to shows since they started opening them back up, but it isn't until this PAX West that it started feeling normal. Right. Like a regular PAX and just regular show again. We're seeing all of our industry friends again. We're seeing our developer friends. We're seeing our all of our content creator friends. We got to hang out with so many of our YouTuber yeah. friends, which is great. And uh, it's just, it feels great to be back in the swing of things, doing it really shows does. again. And my hope is that with Nintendo, Nintendo back here at PAX West, we'll see this kind of return to normalcy with PAX East next year. Maybe PlayStation and or Xbox will be back as well. That would and be And we'll great. have even more cool stuff to cover. Uh, but it was nice having, you know, I do like having that indie focus at PAX. I personally love indie games. We all love indie games here at, at GVG. And so it was nice that even though we did, and if you haven't checked out our Splatoon 3 videos yet, definitely do, because we did cover Splatoon 3 at the very beginning of the show and got some single player and Salmon Run impressions. So check those out if you haven't. But it was nice to be able to cover something super big like that and then cover a bunch of indies like we are right now. So that does bring us to the end. Thanks so much for watching. We love you all. Uh, please do uh, drop a like and subscribe if you love what we do. And uh, if you want to support us even more, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash gbgaming. We do offer a variety of tiers you can support us at, starting at just $1 a month. But again, even if you can't do that, if you just like and subscribe, that means the world to us. We love you, and we will talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.